Hello, everybody. It is 11.30 or so. And right now, we have a talk from a CBM engineer. Questions and answers. So if you have any questions and answers for our engineer, uh, just shout at him or raise your hand or whatever you want. Why, why what? Why aren't you Bill Haney? <laughs> oh, why aren't I Bill Haney? You mean a combination of two I of us? I don't know. That just seemed like a hard question for <laughs> You know I hired Dick Haney. Thank you. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm actually, this is, we're, we're going to fall into infinity. This is camera into camera. Camera into, into camera. camera. I'm zooming in. So. I don't know if he's zooming in. I'm zooming in. Okay. So, Hi everybody again, I'm Bill Hurd. Uh, you heard me talk yesterday, sorry I had an asthma incident right in the middle of it there. Wasn't Leonard Tremiel great? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Hey. Glad to have him. That's a first. And, and that story I knew, but I couldn't tell anybody because I'm sworn to secrecy. And so you got to hear it publicly first, Bob, when Jack left. The one thing I didn't know was he literally left the day after. Remember that picture of him holding the two Teds? He left the next day. And he was out of CBM the next day, and, and I did not know that. So yeah, you heard it here first. So yeah, I kind of rambled yesterday. There was a lot of you know I didn't really give give the the feel of what going into a, a, a you know the final CES show was. So I thought I'd take a few moments now to take questions, but I warn you, I, I tell stories when I give answers. But the you know when we did do finally do the 128, what happened was management was gone and nobody stopped us from doing something. So uh, we tore off a piece of paper, and a, that grid paper, that real small, and the 128 design started from a pencil, a mechanical pencil, and some stencils on my desk. And that's probably the last time that I know of that a computer that goes out and sells millions came from a kid's desk, pencil drawn, and then we, we accumulated people as, as more and more people bought into it. And again, once they saw the 64 mode running, then they're throwing resources at me and whatnot. So it was, it was an unusual time. We got to push from the bottom up and say, this is what the engineers think a computer should do. And that was a first for us for us as well. So during uh, go, the run up to CES, uh, my record with, was 11 days without leaving the plant. I slept in an air mattress under my office, as, uh, under my desk, as did other people. So when so I'd walk in, I'd see a pair of feet, I'd be quiet, you know, kind of working. And uh, my girlfriend was one of the techs there. And uh, I had gotten her in. And so we would actually hot bunk. I would work till one or two, figure out a problem, go go wake her up, and you know say go wire wrap this. Here's how to do it. And then about four or five, she'd wake me up, and I'd go back to work, and she'd go back in the air mattress. And uh, in the the they turned off the hot water at night. And so to to stay clean, because I, I believe in hygiene, even if you're living inside the place. Uh, what I would do is the uh, vice president's coffee maker. <laughs> had been plumped. So you could sit there. So you'd see me walking down the hall with my vat of hot water. And if you walked in the bathroom about five minutes later, you'd usually come walking back out like this. And uh, so I did stay clean. Um, <laughs> coffee maker story. See? Told you I got stories. So one time I did go to make coffee one morning and it missed the pot. I hadn't pushed it all the way under. And it's about 6.30 in the morning. I come in, there's this big puddle of coffee right into the entrance of the vice president's office. His, his secretary's here. Said, and I don't, I don't have that many napkins, right, to put, put. But there were these little holes in the floor where there had been a wall. You know how they had like rebar holes? So I'm sitting there pushing the coffee down these holes in the floor. And a guy named George Robbins, who did the 8 to 500, right, he's now passed away many years ago. He walked by and saw my ankles, and he comes back. And so soon there's two of us pushing coffee down these little holes. In the so that was right above where the production offices was, the guy at Ram. So every time I'm downstairs, you'd see me walking around like this, looking for coffee stains on the ceiling, trying to figure out where it came out. So George Robbins was an interesting guy. Whereas I slept in an air mattress, he would sleep in a pile of bubble wrap. And we called it nesting. And you, you didn't know where you'd sleep. You'd have to walk around, look, you'd see a shoe hanging out from the under, you know, pile of bubble wrap. He'd, then he'd wake up and he'd have these little red dots all over his face from doing it. <laughs> Difference was, George wasn't, didn't, didn't do the shower thing, so we, were, we would donate shirts and, and, and things like that for him. So, um, any questions? 
Yes. Uh, this one may be lost to time, but uh, there, it, the serial attention signal is present on the user board, but none of the other lines on the serial board are present. Is it there for a reason? Or I don't remember anything about the, the serial port would have been the serial port the way the serial port had been. I think somebody asked me about where it was physically and also uh, the video ports. And I, I tell you that um, we would have moved anything for layout just to get, get a good layout. But I do know why the serial port's slow to begin with. Have you heard that story? No. Yeah. All right. I do. The, um, <clears throat> there was the 6526, which had a shift register in it. Hardware shift register. That makes sense, right? Boom, just right, boom, goes out. Well, it, it had an input mode and an output mode. And what happens is while it was on an input mode, a charge would build up in a capacitor, in the capacitance inherited. So when they'd flip that thing around, it would glitch like the attention, I forget the lines, but like a major line, everything, <coughs> go ahead. Well, I didn't mean to say that. And it, the bus would freeze. So the urban legend part of it is, Jack Tramiel goes, it's going to be fixed, it's going to be right here Monday morning. Supposedly he showed them where on the desk they're going to set a working serial bus 1541, 1540 back then. And a guy named Bob Russell wrote the serial bus, bit banging it. And, you know, I mean, he did his job, right? And you, the serial bus then, done that way, has another problem, and that is the big chip comes along and says, everybody, stop what you're doing. I need to get sprite data pointers and stuff, so the timings, instead of being sloppy big, had to be sloppy or big to allow the big chip to get in there and do his thing. And that's the big difference between a 1540 and a 1541. Now, Bob went to fix it. He put extra traces, hand taping days, right? He put extra traces between the sh hardware shift registers and the software ones to the port. It gets to Japan, they look at the artwork, and they go, this is a mistake, it's redundant. It goes to two places, and it only goes, and they took it out, so we missed our chance to fix it. So that's the serial port. And if we multiply the number of minutes, hours, days lost, times 27 million, 80 million, you know, however many people, uh, we probably killed a tenth of the human race, you know, <laughs> just in time. So that's the serial. D did Jack really point at a spot on his desk? I don't know, right? But. Everybody said he did. So, so what, what else does somebody not like about a Commodore? This is your time <laughs> to find out why why something's stupid or something. Yeah. <laughs> of of what? You you mean the Commodore sixty four brown? Yeah. Oh? Um, I don't know. Uh, it would have been designed, uh, quote, designed, and that would have been before Ira Vilensky. You can tell when Ira joined, um, the, like the B machines, that round thing, that's, that's Ira. Uh, but I do know, if you've ever seen the Commodore 64 case, especially later, where the top and bottom don't match, do, do you know why that is? Well, you know, we own Commodore Bahamas. And back then, you didn't want to import a computer. There was a tax on that. So what we did was we imported computer components, a top part and a bottom part. Then we'd marry them up. So they, hadn't, they only met each other once they were in production. And so that's why they were slightly different colors. Uh, they were from completely different runs and things like that. I see that all the time. I think, oh, man, somebody swapped out parts. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and we had what was called the super line down in... Um, in Westchester, uh, we had this huge building. It used to belong to QVC for, for their warehouse. And it was one of those buildings that's big enough it had weather in it. You could see mist swarm and things like that and have high density areas. And the, the super line was so big that there were these bridges up over it. So to cross the, the line, the assembly line, you know, where people were taking them and screwing them together and putting them back on, you had to walk up and over these bridges to, to, to cross it. So it was, uh, it was, it was a pretty cool place. Not in mine. Um, I, there were some we didn't show yesterday where I had pictures of the CES show and stuff, but those actually came from Terry Ryan. We didn't do a lot of cameras back then. You know, I see, I see these books like, 
ooh, Miracle in the Valley, and everybody's all happy. And how you, it's like, what do these guys do? Just stand around and take pictures? <laughs> we're, we're trying to get product out. So no, there, there's almost no. Um, the one guy that took some pictures, Greg Berlin, the five foot eight guy that did the the uh, the, the 1571 and stuff. Um, unfortunately, during his breakup with his now ex-wife, uh, a pile of pictures got burned along with some other things. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, yeah. Well, she she also uh, attacked his. Um, he had a gyrocopter, and attacked it with a screwdriver, and that's actually a federal crime because it's an experimental aircraft. You're not allowed. To. <laughs> so. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, they, they readjusted her meds and, and worked it out. So um, one of the stories about Greg Berlin, though, being, and I could tell you stories, because it's not like having a six foot eight guy, you know, and we'd go in bars. I mean, we were a raft and tumble crowd, and it got to the point where everybody's picking, where I'd, I'd have to go, look, you got to fight me first, then him, and I'd do a Charlie Manson look, and they'd say, well, never mind, you know, we, we'll, we'll do it. But Greg would, um, when he was working on the 1571 and wanted to see if, you know, he wanted to hear it like boot and load and stuff, and he would lay his head on it, and it'd be nice, warm, and vibrating and stuff, and pretty soon he'd fall asleep. Wow. So we'd walk in, and he'd be on, on, on the drive, you know, because it had crashed, right? You know, it's a, and so what we would do is when, when we saw somebody's car, remember, we're living at this place, right? I, I used to eat uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner out of aluminum foil. We'd put on the drive to keep it warm. Um, but when I came from, up, uh, from downstairs, I would bring like hot dogs out of the vending machine and just put them right like next to him where he's sleeping. You know, I still do it to my dog today, you know, where it's like, you know, he'd, he'd wake up and he'd eat a hot dog. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and that drive that, that drive crashed a bit before the 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 techs were merciless. Greg had to go through about eight or nine revs of the board for the 1571. So he walked in one day and they took in every rev and made a big mobile out of it, you know, with all the things and hanging. I mean, and they did. They left it there, and you could, if you wanted to fuck with them, you'd reach up and just tap it, and, you know, let it spin and like. So. What else? I'm sure somebody else hates to go. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, you know, cash, finding time to cash the paycheck was hard to do. Yeah. So it's, uh, and I, I would use like, a, if, if I needed a shower, I would use some of the local, uh, um, uh, you know, the people that live locally and stuff. And then I learned, you know, being a long-haired guy, that was one of the pictures. If you've seen Wikipedia, I used to have long hair and stuff. One of my, pick, I shouldn't say it's a pickup line in a bar, but what I would do is ask a girl if I could go to her house to wash my hair, and that's that's, that's how I did it. So that, that worked back then. It wouldn't work now, but so no, it was uh, um, one time. The it was a Sunday night, and our big electrostatic plotter wasn't printing red. And, and it, was, it was out of this red dye, and there's nobody around to fix it. So we open it up, and we go to fix it. And we pop off this pipe, and this red you know, PVC tubing of red dye starts pulsing. I mean, it looks like an artery. And this is permanent. So it's going bloop, 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 and it's getting all over, and we put it on. And we don't want people to know we're even fucking with the $50,000. I'm sorry, fire trucking with the $50,000 um, electrostatic plotter. But he got on my jeans and permanently stained it because it's like an, or, an, or, uh, uh, an organic protein dye or something. And then as I go to the bathroom and I leave a tra trail on my shoe of oh. red dye and then the sink got stained oh. where I'm trying to wash it off. And they walk in Monday morning and they think it's a murder scene. <laughs> <laughs> they follow the trail. I mean, it was like deer tracking. I and mean, you could watch each new group of survivors, or, or, you know, <coughs> arrivals, you know, track it to the bathroom and stuff. So yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't screw with that machine after that. So it was um, it, when we were at uh, MOS Technologies, they, I didn't talk about it, but the way they made chips, you know, they started with Ruby Lift, where they would literally, I was told they kicked their shoes off and got up on the table, and and they would sit there and, and cut this. Well, it, that's not right because they Ruby Lift needs a light table, so they're not crawling around on the light tables. But what they would do is hand draw the schematics and then hand draw the physical gates and cells and stuff. And then what they had to do was the engineer had to measure each one of those. So an engineer could be brilliant, 
But if he didn't spend three months then measuring the plots, you know, because what they would do is, here's a trace, here's a thing going over it, that's a transistor, because this is the gate of the transistor, here's the contact. So he would make a schematic that said, this is supposed to be two microns wide by 0.4 long, but he had to go then hold his schematic and check it on this plot. And the plot was made on a pen plotter, this big old thing, it had four ink pens, so high tech, right? And it would sit there and go, and it took six to eight hours. You would run out of ink in at least one of those pens during that time. So the trick was, if you ran out of only one color, you could still see the lines in the vellum, right? And you would just know, that, oh, the poly is not drawn. If you ran out of two colors, then they just had to run it all over again. So imagine, you know, we, we, it's a step up from, from um, ruby lith, but yet here we still are doing ink pen plots originally. So, and then, then we got our electrostatic plotter and we were all happy. Um, but as, as we, it turns out, as it would plot, the paper would stretch. You know, it, it turns out we had to take the paper out and let it sit in the room to, to pick up the humidity of the room before we used it. And, and so it's a lot of learning curves we went through back in the day. So, and we, we had started by doing um, compute time sharing to a computer in California and eventually got our own VAXs. And, and so we could actually sit there, ooh, you know, and do our own simulations in house and whatnot. So they did expect us to use pets originally, but that's that's tough. If you've ever compiled on a pet, um, if the printer breaks during the third pass, you walk in and your compile's not done because it's a third pass. You know, it's a three pass assembler. I, I say compiler, but I meant assembler. So eventually, they they were able to move to the. Uh, to the VAX, and then a guy named Headley Davis, who actually went on to do the Xbox and he did the Commodore Mouse, he, he wrote one that actually runs on the 128, so we can compile the 128 on a 128, which is pretty cool. So, what else? Anybody? Urban Legends? Why'd we uh, screw something up? LCD computer. Yeah, yeah. We own the we own the LCD glass for that, and um, there are some interesting things. I mean, it, it was a new technology. Um, the uh, uh, in, in one of the guys I knew worked in the plant that that, that um, you know did the actual fab, and we were trying to figure out. They were, I mean, we're trying to figure out how to get the impurities out of because an impurity would cause two cells to short together. And they were, they were just learning to use like glass fibers as spacers to hold the, the layers apart. And the guy came up with the idea of spinning it. Now, of course, all these processes are worked out, but they, they spun the LCD and all the junk would go to the edges. And that's, so it was still in there, but it was on the edges. So, and then um, the, during that time, um, one of the games that had come out for TED had been uh, got, uh, um, Hitchhiker's Guide, written by Douglas Adams which was one of our theme books. We had them laying all over the place uh, uh, during this time we, we were uh, working. And so he stopped by the booth in uh, the year of the, uh, of the LCD computer. And one of the guys, he's, he's looking at it, he's picking at an impurity. One of the guys goes, hey, use your towel. So if you've ever read Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guy of the Galaxy, he got him with his own uh, catchphrase. So it's a, and he's like the one guy I wished I had met. I was, I was off somewhere with this cute little programmer enjoying myself. And, <laughs> yeah, Miss Douglas Adams, and, and then he passed away not long after. You know, way too early. Let me say that. So, yes. Um, there's two missing bits of RAM. Where did they go? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, if you look at even the manual, it says there's RAM banks zero, one, two, and three. But RAM bank two is RAM bank zero. RAM bank three is RAM bank one. The basic things that are there. But they're all over. Um, you mean it, it, it should be 256K or yeah, 512K? Guy named Joe Kazuki, uh, my boss, who got fired. Um, it was supposed to be 512K native. Uh, I had two pins. All I needed was to spin the rev of the MMU, the memory management unit, one more time. And I, it, the problem was every time MOS was opening a chip, they were putting a problem in. All right. So he said, well, let's not risk it. So I'm like, you know, I, I argued I lost. Uh, so it, it became a 128, you know, 
based machine. As we pull in to CES, and actually when we landed in the airport um, for, the, for the night of CES, all over the floor and along the edges are the flyers for the Commodore 128. And it's, 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 I don't know if it was the one with the Derby and the Apple, but it said expandable to 512K. So as we're there picking up our luggage, I yell at Berlin, who's six foot eight, so I can talk to him across a room full of people with no problem, and I hold one up, and he holds his up. So we're now just learning that we really are compatible to 512K. <coughs> On the way in, we see a billboard. It's cool to see a billboard for something you designed yeah. with a lie written right across. Oh. <laughs> so talk about the definition of bittersweet. So you know, it was 512K. So then what happened at some point, you know, um, Things have to catch up to the lie, right? And so they are, uh, they, they were doing a dog and pony show. This is probably February after, after the CES show. And here's our new CEO, he's in there, and he says, where does the memory expansion plug in? Because we know it's got to be external now. And my boss puffed on a cigar, that's the urban legend part, but he always, you know, that's how we imitate him. He goes, in the back. So I just I started leaving the room. I just kind of because we always hung in the back. You know, we would shout answers, but we would never get in front of these guys. And a group of us meet in the room where we knew her as a whiteboard, and we start talking about how to make a 512K expansion because it, it is fate had been sealed. We were willing to let marketing lie, but our boss just lied. So we had, and that's where the REU came from. And and we got it in time that we could do, do the ROMs to put do the put and the get that yeah put and get. DMA functions because it's a direct memory access. It's literally like two two locations in memory, and uh, that's how we did it. And it worked so fast, we actually liked it. When we went to the CES show in Chicago, then we had a spinning globe demo. I mean, great animation, and and we're doing it because we can write to the video memory faster than we could have animated with the processor. Because it probably took us, probably took Headley, Headley Davis did it, he used Pi, you know, 3.14 and a globe of the Earth, picture of the Earth. And, um, um, you know, probably took him hours to compile it, but we're sitting there spinning it in real time, and that just blew people away at the June CES. And the other thing that blew people away then was Berlin's, uh, uh, he, we had a 128D with Berlin's hard drive in it, and his hard drive caught fire. Ooh. Yeah. The, uh, the, the guy who, who was a programmer on that fancied himself a, a also a hardware guy, which earned him the nickname The Butcher. <laughs> and he had figured out using an LS241 part, if you're familiar, these, these quad buffers that we could flip back and forth. So it's a very hard, very strong driver, right? And it was not a bad idea, but because he came to me and said, you should do it this way, I'm going, I'm going to do it a different way. You know, it's not probably the one time my ego got in front of my so I actually took my TTL um, data book to the bar. And I'm sitting there looking for chips that will do it in the same pinout but differently. And I found, uh, I think it was like an LS125 or something that, that, that did it. Well, it, that actually did catch up to him because when buffers are hitting each other like this, right, they're not soft. They're not going, yeah, I'll get with you. So, and it caught fire because they had two buffers banging right into each other. So they liter literally, they had it coming to him, but it was, it was pretty funny. So now, that, poor, poor Dave, the butcher, right? Um, one time I stopped by his office. He's complaining that he's not reading the index holes on the draw, on the disk. And what's really happened is when he compiled his code this time, it had run off the end of the ROM. So the code's missing to read the. the in, I, we actually had to show him also the LED on the front would stop working because LED on and LED off was right at the end of the code. So I learned that as soon as I didn't see his LED, that he, it's not our problem. So he's got this, the, he's got a makeshift LED in re, right where the sector holes would go. And he's got like a 10 ohm resistor, which is just useless for current limiting. And I looked down and I said, no, that's, you're going to burn that LED up, you just, and I grabbed it and I burned my fingers. That's how high, I mean, this thing was the only guy I live about. So now I'm mad, I'm like, you know, you're gonna burn, <laughs> right? So within a short period later, a week or whatever time, I needed to extend one of my serial cables, right? I needed to get a serial cable from here to here. So I go and I get his 1571 board off his desk, 
he comes walking into the hardware lab and I'm at the bandsaw and I'm, you know those two connectors on the back of the 1571 that are in parallel, those traces? Well, I'm cutting it off of the board with a bandsaw. You know, so yeah, he walks in, looks at me, and I just smile, you know, doing my Charlie Manson. He didn't say a word. So I cut this thing out of his thing, and I made a coupler for two serial cables. And then I go and I put the board back on his desk, you know, so that was my way of getting back at the butcher. So we're friends. I mean, you know, we, we, we but, you know, <laughs> you burn my fingers, dude. <laughs> so as you can see, you could probably talk about anything, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. It's, it's trying to remember all these things these days. So how many people have 128s? Wow. Usually it's 64s that, that, that everybody has, you know, so this is... And I can't believe it's been 30 years. Uh, I can't believe the chips work, you know. Because, yeah, there's an aging factor to it. And then if I was doing my job right, if, if a computer lasted too long, it meant I spent too much money on it. But literally, my job was to be kind of a whore, you know. Oh, hey, that works great, so let's take out some parts, you know? Um, so it, it really had a lifespan of three years, and it, we didn't want it to last too long, because we wanted to sell you another one, <laughs> right? Uh, somebody complained about a 128, um, actually on Hackaday, where I do some, some videos and stuff now. The guy said, yeah, I got one, it's a piece of shit, it only ran Commodore 64, you know, I only used it for Commodore 64s and stuff. And I didn't reply, but I should have, because my answer was, but it got you to buy one. <laughs> and, and that's the way, and we got a second sale on people that had 64s. But you know what? I, you, you ever hear of uh, five pound, uh, 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag? Well, I called it nine pounds of shit in a five pound bag uh, because I couldn't get the last pound to fit. I just couldn't. <laughs> but you know, by putting in a Z80, by putting in the 80 column, even though the 80 column was a bitch, uh, all these things, but, uh, you know, people say, well, or, or, aren't you like upset they didn't use CPM? No, no, not at all. My job's to offer it. How you use it, what, what's popular. I, I don't know any of that, I'm an engineer. But some things will get used and some won't, and that's kind of how we treated it. Um, you, I, you know, did I ever get upset that marketing wouldn't actually market stuff that we thought should be? No, they're mar they don't, we, we're already used to that. You know, so it, it, it'll sell or it won't, and, and they won't, they'll take the credit if it does and, and they'll blame us if it doesn't. And that's just, that's just how we treated it. So, so we, um, we were happy it sold, but we also treated the 128 like we knew it was the last 8-bit machine. You know, at least it's going to come out of us. The 16-bit era was here, the Amiga era is here, and, um, you know, so we, we had this feeling we were closing the door and shutting out the lights on the way out. And I got goosebumped. And, um, you know, and I mentioned that in a Hackaday article, and somebody's like, no, you forgot the 1995 thing you've never heard of. Well, I never heard of it for a reason. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about mass quantities, right? So the last thing, and, and, you know, so when the C65 comes along, and they go, here's something that makes no sense 10 years later. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't count either, you know? <laughs> so, um, yes? Our prototype what? In the C64 days, the head of the lab's name was Dave Zimbicki. And Dave would disappear on a Saturday and bring back boards on a Sunday. And we didn't ask him where he, how. <laughs> Well, in Pennsylvania, they have this problem now with all these PC board houses where they polluted their groundwaters and stuff real bad. So Dave, Dave had one of those. <laughs> so, but he he did it as as a prototype quantity only. I forget who we used. Um, we used a company called Fourth Generation to help a lot till we got our PCB layout in house because we were hand taping using Fourth for like the RAM card on the TED and stuff like that. And um, then uh, we, we poached one of my old friends from uh, where I'd worked named Terry Fisher. He still does PC boards this day, so imagine doing it for 35 years. And um, they put a card in the VAX for him, for a side card, so we could do our own layout. The VAX, slow to a crawl, chip guys can work. So he gave him his own VAX <laughs> just to do that. I mean, so you figure it's a $200,000 chip layout thing. So it wasn't for the, one for the week of, week of heart. Um, one of the jokes we had then was that little phase lock loop board that you saw yesterday. 
um, you know, it's it's December 18th or something, and we it, we, and that we got the 80 column chip to behave itself. So we needed to make these ports. We couldn't go into into the thing. Actually, it's later than that. And we did send for a place for over in one day turnaround, 24 hour turnaround, and they cost 1,200 a board, which my salary was 24,000 back then. So you know, it's it's it was my whole salary in a batch of boards, right? And the guy was late bringing them back, and he was on. He, he, we sent a technician on his motorcycle to go get him on Route 202 in Pennsylvania. And so we're standing around, like, you know, waiting for a pregnancy or something. Right. So we, we start doing these fake radio broadcasts. There's a horrible accident at Route 202. There's PC boards all over. There's a motorcycle down. And it's just, you know, I mean, it's, we're, we're doing this. And finally he shows up, and I think we're hitting him and stuff for taking so long. Because I think he stopped for a beer or something like that. <laughs> So yeah, that was the fastest turn turn we you know that we paid for and, and, and got it. So um, now in in production, it all came from Japan, and there were rules for when you make a million of something. Things like in, you know in the old days we would leave solder under the solder mask. If you ever saw the wrinkly part under the solder, well that's that's solder you're paying for. So we you know our rules became um, uh, you know. How to how to re, you know not use it as if if you saved a, a, a tenth of an ounce solder per board you know you, you just saved yourself uh, hundreds thousands of dollars and stuff so the mass quantities that came out of Japan were, were carefully engineered even the size of the 128 has something to do with the sheet that it came off of so that they got the maximum yield on it so and um, yeah and so at, at the end of the day then they all the production got done over there. And they did away with through holes. They would blow solder into the holes to make through holes instead of plating them, and all kinds of cute little tricks. So, yes? They can what? So, you're saying, can I write to a certain memory on the pet and, and ruin it? Now the only thing I know that, that's like that is on the 1541 disk drive where the read-only memory wasn't qualified by the write line. So if you wrote to the read-only memory, which a Trojan did, it called uh, um, Olympic, Winter Olympic Games 2 or Winter, Winter Games 2, it would sit in a loop writing to the ROM in the 1541 and it would break it that way. But that, that was the only one I knew about. So I, I knew on the early Amigas that every time you did what they called it a widget layer lock or something. There was a statistical chance it would crack. It was a race condition, and so you know, we inherited the 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 the, the Amiga series, and at the same time we're learning things like, well, don't write to it too much. It, it'll be crash. So we had that case in the Amiga where the equivalent of a poke could cause the OS to lock up in the early ones. So we're scratching our heads wondering how they get to get away with crap like that, and we can't. You know? <laughs> So, no, I, I wish I knew more about the pet. The pet was, so when I got to Commodore, you could tell some famous people had been there. But they were gone. They're, I swear, it's a cigar still burning in the ashtray. The seat's still warm, right? But, but they're gone. And I'm talking about the Chuck Pedals, the guys that did the 6502s. Al Sharpentier, Br 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 uh, uh, Yanis, Robert Yanis did the SID chip. Um, you know, I had to listen to people like Andy Finkel, Bob Russell, tell me what these people did and how they thought and stuff. And if I hadn't been a young kid on a mission, I would, should have sat down and said, tell me more about this heritage, right? But I was like, oh, that's cool. Now let's get back to our problem, you know? And, and so I didn't ask enough about these guys. I didn't know who uh, Bob Seiler was, Bill Seiler, um, you know, who I think did the hard way. It's, and it's hard to find some of this out because nobody will fess up sometimes. Uh, trying to get something out of a guy like Yash Terakura, you got to take Terakura. You have to take him out back and beat him with a stick to get him to admit that you know that yeah I did that machine you know because he's, he's so damn modest. So um, uh, yeah, it, it's I, I wish I knew more about what those guys had done, but that was really cool. I mean, there's the cigar butt still burning. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> What do you think about the C? What do you think about the C65? Who likes the C65? Why? I think it was one of the most innovative products to come to work 
You'll stay in the hallway. Uh, <laughs> why, why do you think this? Why do you like to see 65? I, I love the graphics. But wasn't it, what was the graphics? Wasn't it more, more of a big chip type thing? No, they had a uh, Really? The C65? Yeah. I didn't know that. Because the 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 way the 65, now remember, I'm out of Commodore during this time, and so I will admit I had that grapes are sour attitude, right? Fessing up to you. Because in my opinion, if they really wanted to do something like that, they should have asked me to help. Or at least let me back in. And they reminded me about the hole in the wall, right? Which I should tell you the hole in the wall story. Um, but it, it felt like a machine who, it was 10 years too late, I'm talking about how being a bunch of Commodore fell. It was it was 10 years too late, the 16-bit revolution had come, why would we sell an 8-bit machine? And I'll tell you that the motivation behind the machine was they were trying to sell Commodore. They were trying to keep the engineers on board so that when you bought your array, array of Agnes chips and, 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 and Amiga chips, Here's the guys that actually know how to modify it, use them, and change them. So they were paying the engineers double salaries. Um, one guy, Greg Berlin, went and got another degree during this time. He's not even showing up for work you know, on a regular, he's attending school. And so we felt it was a way to keep people busy. And, and uh, uh, you know, 20 million for a bunch of prototypes has to be the most expensive. Because that's why, as far as so many of them, they, they never got past the prototype stage. So. The, if I had to say something good about the, the C65 as I know it, and again, I didn't even know it had did it because I thought it was Commodore 64, compatibly sh down to, so that, you know, that means it's an NTSC based, um, was that Fred Bowen was on it, who of course had done the kernel on 120. So anything Freddie did would have been a good thing, you know, so I, and I asked Fred then, I said, what do you like about, name something good about the 65, and he said, it's got two SIDs, stereo. I, 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 I said, that sounds cool. Didn't, couldn't argue with that one. So, but there, there. I've, I've never really. So, there's a huge crowd that likes it. They spend twenty thousand on eBay for one. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It, it was never going to be in production. You know, and I say that based on knowing what it takes to get a computer into production. So, I, they were, I, they were just masturbating at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's like masturbating with an FPGA. This it's just, uh, it's, I, I could see you know doing it because I'm doing into FPGAs and things like that. But that's uh, you know it's not like it, it earned a, a, a spot in the consumer eye because it never got to the consumers as far as I know. It's 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 you know so maybe that's the appeal is oh off the desks out of the R and D lab. And I wish I had brought my C128 prototypes that I have. Because you look at them, you see, you know, 300 jumpers, and this damn thing worked, and there were three of them, and this 10 billion dollar company, I'm sorry, 1 billion dollar, because we had just it, it, Leonard hit it on the head, they, we had just cleared a billion dollars, um, was standing around watching five of us work, and they're, they're they're taking our word that we can make this thing with 300 jumpers actually work in production, you know. So, was, if if I had any smarts, I'd have been scared to shitless. <laughs> no, that we didn't have the keys yet to the doors. Right, because we'd come down from King of Prussia down to Westchester, and the security department decided that all doors with locks should be locked by them at night. So I come in. I work weekends. I work every day. Right? I come in on a Saturday when the security department and uh, and I'm just like, you locked my door. Actually, I, I I had to deal with the door, and then I got back to him. So to, to get in so I can do work, I had to crawl up over the ceiling and get that white crap all over you, you know, from the full ceiling, so you're trying to get over the frame. Drop down the air side and unlock it. And we put up a sign that said, please don't lock this door, there's no key. We were polite, we were nice. And the next day it's locked. Up over the top again, white crap all over me again, itchy, because I got to sit in this room that's 95 degrees and sweat on the board. And the note said, don't lock the door. There's no key. It's locked again. They will tell you I punched through both walls in one punch. <laughs> it took two. 
<laughs> I just missed the light switch on the other side by a little bit, or I would have taken the skin off my nose. Ask me about my finger then next. Um, the, but, but by the time everybody got there, because they were whoomp, whoomp, by the time everybody got there, I'm reaching through to unlock it. Still getting white shit all over me. <laughs> and I unlock the door. Put up a sign. Don't lock the door. They lock it. This time the sign is, look, assholes, there's a hole in the wall. Stop locking the door. You know, the louts. And, and, and we admired it, actually. It's like, geez, you know, such, such devotion to duty. <laughs> you know? But so that the hole in the wall was, you know, that, that's how I got in to do the work. So I was not being malicious or something. So the QA manager who wants a project would stand up on a chair and go, it won't work. And then anything that happened, he'd go, I told you so. Well, that's not what QA is supposed to do. QA is supposed to catch errors, help us fix them. So, um, a, 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 you know, he took on the role of getting the hole fixed. And so we would get to these meetings. I'm like, all right, we're in a one, two, three fix on layers of the MMOS. I've split the lot. And then get to him, and he's like, well, we're proceeding on finding a contractor for the hole in the wall. And the, uh, we're expecting to use plaster for the hole. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, oh my god, <laughs> don't you have something better to do? So he, he was some, um, <coughs> one time, see, there was a time to even use the MMU that we actually had to rely on some of the QA code. Because uh, you know they, they wrote to help test the MMU banks, the memory banks, and you know the MMU uses a 16-bit register, but the 6502 only has 8 bits. So how do you write? Well, we said write it high bit, high byte, low byte, or the opposite. And it's on the second one when you write it, both will be latched. But you do it in that order. And I may I would have been high byte, low byte because I, I like decrementing loops. All you programmers probably do too, right? Decrement till branch if not equal or branch not equal to you're done. And the MMU started screwing up, so the 128 started screwing up, and they would lock this cabinet at night. Put this little listing in there. It's like, you're not that important. Why are you locking the cabinet? Well, I should have known. So eventually, you know, that night, I pull the ROM, their ROM out, and I stick it in the data I.O., and I step through it. Now, I've got, there's, there's a girl that worked in QA, and she was good. I liked her a lot. Her name was Kim Henry. I said, you watch that I'm not going to do anything illegal here or, you know, because I know what I'm looking for. And sure enough, I'm standing in front of the data I.O. and they're, they're writing it in the wrong order. But they had been writing it in the right order. So they're fucking with me. So I fuck with them back. The, and and this, this is true. This, is, this helped my reputation. I stood there at the data I.O. and reprogrammed it to write in the right order, you no know, pulling up the opcodes from memory. Hit program, put it in, and it works. Just like that. I said, Kim, you saw it. She said, she's fine. Yes, I did. And so the next day, uh, when, when I go to report this, I said, yeah, we got it working. The MMU was being written wrong in the QA code. We, we fixed it. And he goes, how'd you do that? That cabinet's locked. <laughs> just, just nailed yourself. <laughs> you know? So he proved that you know, it was kind of a, a known thing that, that, that they had done and, and screwed with us on. So then one time, this QA guy tries to get me fired, and he got the QA guy from downstairs to kind of help team double teaming. And remember, I'm not afraid of losing my job. Every mental manager in the place is, because the, the, you know there used to be a thing called a Jack attack, which is more urban legend than real. But what there was was once Jack was gone, middle management multiplied lemmings, sheep, whatever. Right? They just kept multiplying. And, and the people that responded to him kept molding. It was like a Dilbert back then. And, and um, oh, and I knew if I talked about it too much, I'd lose my place. So the, uh, um, what were we talking about? Yeah, but the, so what, did, what did, oh, so he tried to get me fired. So um, the, the, um, the, we had made a mistake in the PLA for the 128. Now we used to manually compile this and I could hold the list of green and white paper level with my shoulder and it went almost to the floor of the terms. See, if you've seen the PLA terms for a 64, it's this big. Well, ours is like eight times as big, so it gets to the floor. And I, it wasn't me that made it, but I was a project leader, so I, I said, yeah, it's my fault, I, I screwed up. And it was simply an X where a one should have been. And what happened was one of the Ultramax modes didn't work the I.O. banking mode of an Ultramax mode. And so our own soccer 
but done by UK didn't work. Oh, it's a disaster. I told you it wouldn't work. Okay. So we go into a meeting. And so I've got to spin this chip. You know, I mean, we're coming up on CES, and, you know, we, we clearly made a mistake. And um, so I come in, and I say, okay, you know, here's, here's how I'm going to fix it. And at the head of the table now, Elton Southard's left as the president of MOS. I can't remember the new guy's name. He's vice president of Commodore. He's president of MOS. And the QA manager guy interrupts me, and he's sitting with the other QA guy. I should have known, you know, enough to know. He goes, well, we have proof that it was you that screwed up. I said, yeah, so here's how we're going to fix it. He goes, no, and he slides some papers forward. I can still see it. Here's bumps again. I can still see it in my head, money. No, we have proof. I said, yes, I fucked up, and that's the exact words I used. I said, here's how we're going to fix it. Now, I had held half the batch back. Called it, 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 CMOS chips are, uh, NMOS chips are made with six layers in the passivation. We call it one, two, three, which was diffusion, uh, Depletion, I can't, I can't remember them all these days. And then uh, we would take a batch of these, and it costs like almost a quarter million to make a batch of chips. We would do the first three layers of the cake, so to speak, take half of them and put them in nitrogen and store it. And then we would grow the fourth, fifth, and sixth layer on it, and we could, that, it's like the end terms and the or terms. So uh, I said, here's how we're going to fix it. I, I've, I've got a one, two, three batch, we're going to pull it out, we're going to figure out the term, and he interrupts me again as I'm telling, and this guy at the end of the table clears his throat, the, the president of or president of MOS, and he goes, <clears throat> I think Bill's trying to tell you he's got control of the situation. And you can see these two QA managers, the guy leans away from the other one real <laughs> quick like this. Like, it's all you. And he's, he's still trying to push this little pile of papers. You know? So my attitude was, and I said it, I, I watched the movie uh, Heaven Can Wait, and there was a line in there that said, I don't care how much it costs, I care how much it makes. And I actually said that. I said, you know, we're making mistakes because we're going fast. So I don't care how much it costs, I care how much it makes. So here's how we're going to fix it. The guy said, next topic. You know, so that, that's how I got past being, you know, being ganged up on and being fired. So that was, yes? The what? Which? Like Ferdinand Porsche? Guy designed the uh, Tiger II and the and the Volkswagen. Don't know anything about it. Yeah, I did. I wouldn't even know he was still alive. So, no. There's the whole wooden pet. You heard Leonard talking about Leonard uh, about the wooden pet number one. I think yesterday, or we were talking up here. And so there is there is. Um, some really cool stories, and I actually have some of them with Chuck Peddle. And if you guys were here a few years ago, quite a few years now, Jerry and I, uh, inter Jerry Ellsworth and I interviewed Chuck Peddle, and he talked about through those. But the problem is, you can listen to Chuck talk for six hours, and he still has another six hours to go of all this interesting stuff. But and it deals with he he would be the guy to answer that. I can even try and ask him that question next time. He'll either guffaw at me or or say, oh yeah, here's here's the you know, and then be so. Were the rounded pets uh, designed by Ira Velinsky? I don't believe that metal case was designed by oh, Ira. The rounded ones. These B machines and stuff were designed by Ira. Uh -huh. And uh, Ira passed away. I don't know if I mentioned he passed away coming back from a CES show for Atari. And I didn't know it till Leonard told me when we met at the 25th anniversary. So here I'm like, hey, who do you know? I know this Ira. And I said, he's passed away. And I'm like, you know, and it was just so. Um, the, the guy that came after, you know, when suddenly we shift to what became the C64CR, the 128, and the Amigas, that was a guy named Min Luong who designed that. Now, we got Min from Franklin. And uh, at some point, Min decided he was going to go back to Franklin. The problem was, Min had the prototypes they were working on shipped to his house just as he's leaving Commodore. This is a true story. And again, they don't take kindly to that. They sent the FBI after him. Uh, you can't just take off with like $80,000 prototypes of a competitor's house. And the poor guy had to leave. The, he spent two years in Japan, you know, waiting for a statute of limitations to run out or whatnot. So, I mean, it's like almost everything's got a story about it. But he's an excellent designer. He just shouldn't have tried taking the designs with him. Yes? 
Uh, don't know anything about it other than uh, it's really cool. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, if I had to pick my favorite that was in production, um, you know, I like the 120D of, of, of my era, you know, that the D was supposed to, um, you know, to, to be kind of, uh, given that we, if we didn't, couldn't put a small monitor on, but the SX64, uh, you know, there was K-Pros and Osborns, and they were like EL displays and stuff, and then we had this color thing that could play games and things. The only thing about it was it banged your ankle, you know, because it's off-center when you carried it. But that was really cool. And, and it had a nice monitor in it. I've used that monitor doing some, some other things. But Greg Berlin, uh, like, built one into his Saab, into his dashboard. You know, nowadays everybody's got, got, got a, t you know, flat screen, you know, on there. But he, we were shoving CRTs in our dashboards so with those things. <laughs> so it's, um, uh, yeah, the 128D was supposed to release the same day as the C128. And it caused us a lot of grief to get the PC board to fit both. It has all the circuitry for both. If you pull one out and look, there's a hole in the circuit board right where I need to run a bunch of traces. But it's there because it fit a post that would be in the C128 plastic, right? I don't know, is that a real one? And that would have been a cool machine, all built in one like that. Again, it has the same problem, banged you in the, banged you in the leg because it's off center. It's got a metal shield. Ah, yeah, you can't see it. But anyways, this was what was supposed to be released. So I'm gone before I figure out that they haven't released it. And then three years later, supposedly, the metal one. That's not my board. <laughs> no, you know what? They put the 1541 on there. Right? That's got the disk drive also on there. Yeah, right, right. But, the, but this board here, you'll see, is, is, is not that size. That's a regular C128 board right there. And uh, so when we laid out that board, the, the, the last five traces of the Commodore 128, again, we're on the side cards and we're doing this. What had happened was Adam Schwanier had uh, um, gone to Italy for a week, and the head of drafting department flexed his muscles and said, well, the 128 has gone on for far too long. I'm demoting it to the lowest priority, and I'm putting all my resources on something else. So Adam gets back and says, what the hell? And so, oh, yes, I'm getting my man right on it. So we worked all weekend to catch up to the layout of the final PCB layout of the Commodore 128. And I'll tell you that the last five to six traces took almost 12 hours. Because we had three shifts, one guy each. And they were like air traffic controlmen. You'd see them working and to move a trace. I mean, they'd work for an hour to finally make room for a trace to move. And, and near the end of their shift, they'd start slowing down. And a guy would come in and he'd sit next to him. And as they're, you know, the guy next on shift, and pretty soon he's pointing. And pretty soon he's going, yeah, do it here, do it here. And eventually he gets the, he gets hold of the mouse, and he starts doing it. And the air guy's like, oh, you know, I'm out of here, I gotta leave. And, you know, so over the course of this weekend, so my role then was suddenly, I'm, I'm the one that's, that, that just got shit on. Because uh, I've got to be there all three shifts, all three days, if we're going to be successful, because they're going to ask me questions. My role as an engineer is, you know, they'll say, can I run this here? And I'll, sometimes I'll say, no, you can't. Um, and so what I did is I took my air mattress in there. Actually, I brought in my military air mattress. I had been in the service. And I slept in there. And it's, an, and it's a big air-conditioned room, so I'm sleeping under my coat. And I told them, just tap me on the foot if you need something. And I would. I'd sit right up, answer question, go right back down, right? I bought some. They weren't Egg McMuffins, but they were the... Um, the, the competition, whoever makes the, uh, the, wa the Whopper. Uh, uh, Burger King. Yeah, Burger King's version of Egg McMuffins. I bought like three or four of those on Friday. And on Sunday, they were still good, sitting there in the cold <laughs> with us. So, you know, I just had this little selection on the shelf, and I would sit there and nibble on them and stuff. And, and that's how we did it. And I mean, I remember the last three traces just took frickin' forever. And it, part of it, again, was the hole for the 128. And so here, for the 128D, and so here they never did the 128D. They, then eventually we get the black diesel, whatever it's called, the metal one. I mean, I like the sound of it. <laughs> I mean, that's how I feel about it. Um, it, it. It looks like they have ground noise and some other things. The video's not as good. And I can look at there and tell what they didn't like about 
what I had done, some of the things like the Z80 clock, which is a cool story. And, um, but I don't like the way they did it either. <laughs> but but I, don't, I don't like the, the machine itself because, you know, because things like video noise, when you're in the video business, should the video noise should, shouldn't exist. So that's kind of how I looked at it. Why they waited three years to do what was obvious from the first day, I don't know. Were you guys doing all routing or did you do hand routing? Yeah, it was all push and shove. Even on the side cards, it, it was, it, it, they, they could um, kind of bump up against and the traces would kind of go with them a little bit, but it was all hand routed. That's why I say it took, you know, the last three traces, the traces probably took eight hours. Um, and, and they're just manually moving every single one. And, and of course, it's all two layer, you know, because we're a consumer. C8000 guys had four layer, never got done with their product, but they got to use four layer, and, and we're doing two layer boards. So, and, um, you, you know, so the biggest thing I had then was, uh, you know, there's only a certain amount of ground <laughs> that you have room for. And ground is everything in, in a computer like that, especially with DRAMs and stuff. So, our challenge was how do you make a two layer board act as good as a Modern day four layer board for noise. No. Yes? The 1570 came out before the 1571. Is a, I don't. What's. There's like a. 1540. 1570. 1570. And which one is that? Is that it's one of the big. It looks like a 5041C white case. Oh, is it the one with the I, IEC connector on the back? Yeah. No, that's a 4000 one? Yeah, it's, but it's a, it's a 1571. Uh, Okay. Okay, well, I was going to ask why they, apparently they got a newer ROM version than the 1571 that came out a few months later. I was wondering how that happened. I don't know anything about it, um, but I know that the difference between zeros and ones, first off, the original 1540 and the 1541 was the 1540 was designed for the BIC 1 chip, which didn't do sprite data for pointers, fetches, and the 1541 had newer code that could wait for that extra latency and stuff. So that one I knew about. But I don't know anything about the uh, about the model you're talking about. Now the keeper of all models of disks for copying and, and going from one format to the other was Fred Bowen. You know, the guy who did kernel and C sixty five. And you walked in his office and he had every model there, all hooked up. And and you would hand him two different strange size disks, and he would copy for you. You know, so he was the guy that knew all of all, every every one. Of them. Bigger question I always had is why were we doing 100 DPI instead of 96? You know, if anybody's familiar with code, we I think we invented 100 uh, tracks per inch instead of whereas the industry standard was 96, which did things like put us into the mucky area. It's like on a racetrack where all the rubber builds up. You know. We're, we're doing that on the disc because we're trying to do 100 tracks per inch and stuff like that. So, yeah, this is strange. What do you know about the 1551? Never heard of it. See, I, I, came, I came later, or I mean, all that came later. And What's that? Okay, say it again then, I'm sorry. Right. Right. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were talking about the TED drive and stuff. I thought I talked. So that was designed by the, the you know, um, Greg Berlin did it again, the six foot eight guy, and the butcher did the, the code that's in it. And, uh, you know, it was just, I think, one of those things that made sense to us. We didn't have to worry about certain compatibilities and things. Um, most of the TED drive stuff, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, didn't meet its expectations for speed. Uh, the, the, the programmer had, and we used to tease him about it. You'd ask him a question about speed, and he had a calculator watch. He'd go, uh, two no ops, a, a JSR, and a thing, and he'd tap on us, and he'd say it'll be five times faster. And we're like, oh. <laughs> really? <laughs> and, and then later, when it's two and a half times faster, he'd go, well, I never said no, you tapped on your watch, dude. So we would walk around, and whenever we, there was a nebulous answer, we'd say, well, it's a couple of no ops, a JSR, and an ACK. Then act like we were tapping on our watches. <laughs> so it, it, you know, the, the guy should have said, "I'll get back to you," and you know, gone and done some code modeling or, or something and figured it out. So the TED series of drives always suffered from a uh, um, could have been this, but ended up that. And then, of course, Jack had left, and so there's no fear of doing it wrong. Not not real fear. 
of, of you know having a limitation set like a curfew or something you know it's like so uh, you know and, and the machine series has been taken over by a guy named uh, Bill Miller so pretty soon they're calling it the Miller machine and the guy's been like the director of engineering for three months you know he's there at the very end and uh, one of the things they did was somebody confused uh, mega instructions per second with cycles per second or something and they thought that the thing is faster than oh my god it wasn't a cray but it was like a sperry or something they, no <laughs> it's not you're, you're being fools <laughs> so and for a while there they thought they had this bitchin' little supercomputer <laughs> and, and and because they're all just repeating what management said they're going yeah, I, and I knew the numbers at one time. It, was, it, it would have been pretty impressive if we could have done that without Freon and the cooling system. You know? <laughs> so, sure. For the 128, if you had a little extra room, you know, the extra time, a little extra budget, what would you have added to the 128? Another pound of shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the one that didn't fit. I, I don't know. I, it's well, the, the RAM expansion, obviously, the, that, that it should have been capable of, and we could have done that by going to the by four technology. You know, 256 k DRAMs were just coming out where we could have done 64 k by fours and fit it. Um, but you know, having been through every step of the process, you 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 can't fall upwards at all. You can only fall downwards. So we never we never really looked back. You know. Um, should we have shot a few more people in management? Probably. <laughs> by, by the way, one of the pictures I had yesterday that, that we didn't get a time to show was when we were at the CES show. Um, we had this room where we would... Uh, um, oh, remind me to tell the CPM story and then, then it, 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 I'm probably out of time. Um, but so, so we got these things there in this 80-com chip that's been a super bitch. You know, we're opening these things, we're putting the chips in, we're picking whether it's got these real strong pull-ups if it's going to do light on dark, or really strong pull-downs if it's going to do dark on light, and we adjust the voltage for each one. So each power supply, we adjusted the voltage down to 4.75 because the VIC chip for multicolor character mode, like Wizard of, that thing with the flying wings, Wizard of Zor or whatever, would work. But we needed 5.25 volts to make the 80 column chip work. So we have this little production line of that. And then the picture's pretty cool. There's even like a beer can sit there and the thing. But if you turned around and looked at the door behind it, there was the Commodore death list. And everybody that pissed us off during the show made this damn list. And, and then it, it had death by how we were going to do it. You know, it pissed off Judy Braddock, thrown off balcony, you know. And it was, so it's one of the things you don't see. But in that room, you see some CPM disks stuck on the wall and things. And what had happened was the 8563 had been this really bad bitch. Even the, even the designer of it wasn't used in the current rev, as I alluded to yesterday. Well, it turns out that the guy that wrote CPM had found a rev he liked. It was three revs old, and he worked out of his house, so he wasn't with us daily. He was a consultant. And it had a heat problem, because that was the other one. So what he did was he took his butter, uh, the butter melting cup out of his Mr. Popcorn, but, uh, popcorn Popper. He would put an ice cube in it and he would set it on the chip. So he'd get a half an hour per ice cube. And so he, he got it to work that way. Well, he shows up at the CES show. Here we are, we're setting up for the show. And we go to run CPM. And of course, he hasn't written the code for the newest version. And some things have happened, like they had screwed up a register so bad that we had to write to it twice in a row. We called it a Texan write, because the guy's from Texas, Texas, right? It's like, do it, do it again. <sighs> you know? So, so we were like, Vaughn, you, you, you got to like bang it twice. You know, you got to. So when it scrolled, it would leave characters behind. It looked like the Matrix. You know how that drippy thing like this. So the more it scrolled, the more it, it would just you know cry, and it was really sad. And, and so we we're like, Ron, here's here's what the code should look like. You know, Freddie showed him. This guy sits down the night of CES setup. He doesn't have his system to compile CPM with him. It's a huge system. Doesn't have. It. But he's got a sector editor. So he edits the sector on a disk, and the sectors are backwards on the disk, and the bytes in the sector are backwards. Finds the section on the disk that does it, hand edits it 
to now do it the way it needs to do, and does it so that the checksum still matches. So you can't change that for you can't calculate the checksum for the whole thing. And it frickin' works. And we're just like, you know, and that was a Commodore night. That was a Commodore engineer, you know, just right up to the last minute fixing stuff. And, and Vaughn was just like one of those superheroes, you know. And management never knew what, what we had to do, but the picture sitting there doing, fixing it with a disk editor the night of CES. And it was the first three systems you walked in when you walked into the booth, it was the CPM. And, and so either it worked or it did. So, and we had a, we had 100% of them working um, in the booth, except every now and then a marketing person would come running up, they're breaking left and right, and you walk over and you put it back in 80 column mode, so don't touch that again, you know? <laughs> so so that, that was kind of it for the CPM story, but that, that, that's one of the ones that, uh, that, that's one of my favorites. So, anything else? Were you involved in, uh, in Basic 7? Terry Ryan, the guy that wrote Link Arms Don't Make Them in the Easter Egg. Terry got in trouble for doing he was told, don't do, Terry wanted to do structure. Do while, loop until. His boss, Julian, Julian. Oh, somebody remind me of Todd the font rhyme story. I'm sorry, I got stories. No, I'll get to you guys, I saw your thing. Um, but he's like, no, don't, don't do it. I'm telling you, no. And, but Terry did it anyways. He did loop while, do it. He did structured basic, right? Because we didn't like go-tos, we really did. Well, when Terry got his review, people loved it, right? And his boss, and this is a quote, said, yes, while what you did apparently was correct, you nonetheless didn't do what I told you to, you get a 3% raise. And the guy had just revolutionized basic, you know? So that was the guy just ignoring his boss. He got, the, the boss got fired so, <laughs> by the end of it. So it's a, yes? What did you do when you left Commodore? Um, well, I found myself addicted to stress and needing to do stuff and you know I worked at some places but I ended up like working in Cooper Trauma Center in Camden, New Jersey on my spare time and running on the turnpike as, a, as an ambulance I, uh, as a captain of a first aid squad and stuff so I had to get my fix like doing emergency medical care and stuff so what's that? No, it's, it's like, I, I peaked early, you know, you've heard of burning the candle on both ends, so I just set the whole damn candle on fire. And after that, it's just, just nothing compares, you know, so it's all just been a ghost of a life after that. So, so you might as well go, you know, oh, I saved an air life tonight, but still, still, still not like CES 85. <laughs> so, um, I thought we were going to close a lot sooner than we did. I didn't know they'd hang in there for eight more years. You know, Jack had gone, and then my boss, Adam Schwanier, had quit. And um, I made a lot of enemies in the meantime, and yeah, not you. Um, and uh, uh, so I didn't want to be on the street with every other employee because there were some damn good engineers there, you know. And I, I didn't want to be on the street with the good ones and the bad ones all looking for jobs. So later, I'm sorry I did. I should I should have stuck. I should have I should have been more mature. But I was so addicted. I was like, oh, I need my next project. Where's my next project? I didn't know how to hang out. I didn't know how to just go take a shower and take some naps. You know, I, I should have done that. So uh, I, I, I became a director of engineering for a machine vision system company. Uh, our customers included early uh, McDonald's and stuff. And then I found out it was a farce. That the, the company wasn't really interested in technology. They were interested in the investors. And it was one of those where it was a, you know, keep going through the motions, but don't you dare actually get done. And I didn't get along with that, so. Um, what was the story? Oh, the, the font wrong. All right. So while doing the Easter egg, I don't know if you saw it. It says link arms don't make them. It says Vaughn's name. That's why I remember this. They had blown, the, the font ROM was wrong. There was a bar above the V in reverse. So the regular V was good. Again, our QA department didn't catch it. You'd think our QA department would tag every letter, right? You know the shift Q's broken on the, on the original C128? It's our QA department. It's like, you never did a shift Q. We didn't, obviously, but you know. It's <laughs> so the V was broken. So we had to spin the ROM, and they, you know, they had, I didn't know this till later, the guys couldn't even tell the people how they found it, but they found it while they were programming the Easter egg, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, so we're sitting in our meeting, I'm going, yeah, we're going to spin the font, because I was in charge of the font ROM, because it's hardware, right? And Julian decides that it's software. That's, that's fine, here. Go for it, man, dude. But I learned perk charts, I didn't know how to do them, but those bubble charts, 
where if you actually look at your lead times, you go, oh my God, if I hadn't done this by four days from now, I'd have missed this date here and there wasn't a thing I could have done, you know, when, when you have these lead times of making chips and stuff. So I was like, you know, it's got to be done by, uh, um, by Friday. You've got to approve the ROM that is now your responsibility and you've got to get it over to MOS so they can run it. It was going to take a month and a half just due to the priority of, of something, the way they ran that kind of thing. Meanwhile, a memo had come out, because you know I was known for breaking holes into the wall so I could get into my own workspace and stuff. Um, there had been some theft out of the desks and stuff. And it was our own security guards, same, same guys that were stealing out of the, out of the uh, trailers. You know. And so there, we had humorous memos going around about the theft of bags of peanuts and things like that. But they, the management took it seriously when the management offices also had stuff so they were stolen. So they put out a memo that said, do not break into the ice management officer, uh, offices, and it all but said, this means you bill her. <laughs> all right, so that's the setup for this. So Julian has my font run. Julian, how's it going? Oh, we're looking at it. Julian, how's it going? Under evaluation, Julian, so about Thursday, I break into his office. I climb over the ceiling and get that white shit all over me again. I steal the ROM out of his desk drawer. Sitting in the desk drawer, I hadn't moved. I saw where he had said it when, you know, when we'd gone back to his office. I knew where to look. My handwriting was still on it. I release it to MS. I put it in a, in a carrier thing over there. It's Friday. It's the day I said. So Monday, um, in the meeting, so Julian, how is it coming? Oh, we're almost done with the evaluation. Oh, well, he hadn't moved it. And I looked at him, I go, liar. And here's this long-haired kid pointing him out. This liar, I broke into your office, I stole your ROM, and I've already released it to MOS. And it, the unspoken part is, so what are you going to do about it? And, and the boss is like, thank God it's over at MOS. <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, and that's, that's, you know, he was one of the ones. So I, my revenge on Julian was this. Um, I had a special relationship with the vice pre uh, president, uh, Adam Schwani. I slept on his couch. Um, when, when my air mattress was full. Um, remind me about my shoes. Somebody, I'll tell you the shoe story. I, oh, I'm sorry. And so his secretary comes gets me. And, and she, the way she said he wants to talk with you, I knew something was up. So he's got the list of people being laid off. And it's a long overdue calling of excess. And somebody had scratched out, had like put a check next to Julian's name and then erased it. And he just pointed at the list. He didn't say, pick who you want fired. He didn't. I just put my finger back on Julian's name and he rechecked his name. And that was it. We, I didn't actually say anything. So it was, and it was because of shit like that and the shit he did to Terry that, you know, it's, he's actually impeding the process. So that's, that was kind of a, it, so like I said, I made enemies. So once Adam was gone, I was left in. So the, the shoe story though, um, even though I would take showers and everything, I would be on my feet. 18, 20 hours a day. Your shoes remember that. And uh, so I, my tennis shoes got pretty ripe. And I remember I had gone to Adam's office to lay down to go to sleep. I kicked my shoes off, and I'm laying there on the couch, and so my, the smell of the shoes woke me up. <laughs> so I go back to my office, I'm now awake. And I kept finding, two hours later, like a couple hours later, a security card comes by and goes, were you in Adam's office? I'm like, did you smell my shoes? He goes, yeah. Because, you know, you knew the smell from when I'd be. So I kicked those shoes into the corner of my office and left them there. You know, just went out and got, had, like, had my girlfriend bring me a new pair of shoes or something. Well, a, a mouse chewed through the nose of the shoes and took up a residence in it. And I called it the Commodore Mouse. I feed little Fritos and stuff. And uh, um, so one night, Commodore Mouse had wandered too far down, and Headley and a guy named, uh, I, I can picture him, they're, they're down the thing, and the mouse had turned the corner, and saw him and went, speak. And they're like, let's get it. And so they're chasing the mouse, and the mouse is going like this, back down the hallway, and turns left into my office area and stuff. And they come into my office, I swear they had pitchforks and stuff. I'm like, don't you fuck with my mouse. <laughs> oh, you know, you know. <laughs> That's a true story. So I give them all freedoms. So yeah, it, anything you know, a pair of tennis shoes was was the right material for back then. So. Anybody else? Uh, I'm sure you guys have another project. To, yes. Why is the one point eight big? Should have big not enhance at all. 
I was like, we're thinking, oh my god, I could work in fast mode, or maybe just added some of the colors to the, 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 the series. It could not work in fast mode. Because the bus is split in two. There, there's this time for the VIC and time for the processor. Fast mode is when we take both cycles for the processor. So it's an architectural thing where it says there, we took everything. There is no time. The colors, there, is, there was a set width of everything. Sprites, sprite registers, everything. You can't suddenly add one to anything because you add one everywhere, right? And, and then there's, quite honestly, there's risk you know, even mucking with it. What he did do was go in and clean the colors up and stuff in the vector where they make the vectors of, if, if you know how chroma works, chroma is, is a, a degreed angle of something like, you know, and he cleaned the noise out of that and stuff. Um, the one I catch grief about is why, why did I leave the double speed register where people could get to it, right? And I remember the three seconds I, I made that mistake. And I, and I say mistake, but I don't know that I'd do it different. So what went through my mind when uh, it came down to that was here's this register, it's above the other ones, and, and so you're not supposed to be writing there. Um, but the VIC chip didn't reset very well. My fear was, what happens if we, see, see the biggest thing you cannot have happen when this thing goes to production is it not work, right? It's just better to have it have issues than not work. Well, what if, pressing reset, it goes in a double speed mode, and pressing reset, you can't write to it to get it back out, because it's in double speed mode already, and, and the reset button's not bringing it out. So I was afraid of locking ourselves out of the ones, out of the VIC chip, and, you know, because I could have said, right here and then right here, and it'll go away and stay away, right? Well, how do I get it back if, if I made it go away? How do I get it back if there's no reset line going to the VIC chip? And Freddie had the same problem in the 8563, how, how do I figure out when I reset? Well, he used to write stuff out to RAM and read it back and goes, am I doing a cold start or a warm start? He couldn't tell if he's doing a cold or warm start. And then the DRAM got so good that even after being turned off 10 seconds, you'd still find, you know, because it's starting to turn the CMOS. So it was a decision of safety versus somebody screwing up. Now, re Return to Fractalis was the first one that we caught. And we caught it afterwards. And I didn't care. We've already passed that point. You know, I'm, you know, Will people buy less Commodore 128 because Return of Fractalis doesn't work? And I'd say, well, if there's 10, God bless them, right? Um, the, uh, the, uh, so, I'm, I'm trying to remember the train of thought there. Uh, so, so it was just, you know, it, it, it was, oh, oh, so what they did was, that's what I was going to do, is normally you did a decrementing loop, so, you know, and wrote to your, to your, or to your VIC registers. What Return to Fractalis did was jump into a random part of an image of the VIC chip, you know how it's echoed? Yeah. And it went up and over and around and through, and so it was writing garbage and then wrote good stuff, and so it overwrote us accidentally. And, and I mean, it was such an accident, but what we had learned about the uh, users and the developers was there, there's, there's no wrong answer, you know, nobody told them not to do shit like that, so they, they did it. And uh, so, yeah. They, they wrote the wrong way. It was obviously a bug in the code, and, and they, they blew it out. So now somebody in one of the in the CBM hackers group made the statement, and he's talking from demo. He's talking about purity of VIC chips and stuff, and he, he made the comment that like we in the 128 crowd had tried to perfect the VIC chip and failed. We tried to replicate it exactly and failed, and that's just bullshit. We, we just needed it to work. Um, and, and work in, in the way it defined by, would less people buy it or not? And so, no, we didn't try and make it perfect. All the things he was judging, what we should have done in the VIC chip, meant nothing to us. So, uh, you know, I think I actually quit the CBM hacker script after that. It's like, now you guys are just talking about this other stuff. That, you know, if you design computers, you know, for consumers and made millions of them, the crap you're talking about is meaningless. So. And somebody once got me like the, t the 116, we should have built a switching power supply in it instead of like a power resistor and a regulator. Well, it's like, why? We wouldn't have sold less, it would have been more expensive and it still would have worked the same way, so why would we do, you know? 
the, you have to have a reason to do the stuff you do, and the reason better be cost savings first, you know, for, for selling millions. So, what was the one question, Robert, somebody had asked you, you, you had said, uh, we should have used which processor, the video processor for, in, in the 128, we shouldn't have used the VIC chip. We should have used that slightly cooler one that nobody ever heard of or something. And it's like, the, the main thing when you release a computer is you've got to have software the first day. I mean, if you bought a computer and the first day you buy it, you can't use it, right? So that's what was cool about the 128 that allowed us to leverage it was you could run 64 software the first day you got it. And then hopefully, you know, 128 came out, which not much did. And even CPM, you could run, use the 80 column monitor the first day you bought it. Suddenly CPM sounds a little better. Um, had we used something that's 10% cooler and never been used before, it's, 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 it's a C65 at that point then. It's totally useless for users, right? So that was, that was kind of my answer to that was uh, it, it, it didn't show an understanding of, of trying to go into a consumer market. Uh, anybody else? I'm sure you're all tired of hearing me talk by now. Of course, this will be the last time. Oh, by the way, I want to thank Robert for, for asking me here. He, he's asked before, and, and, and just the way it kind of came up, the 30th anniversary, and the thought crossed my mind, I probably won't be around for the next one. You know, you never know it. Once you hit 56, you know, 55, it's a statistical thing. So uh, it's, it made sense to finally come see you all in your native habitat. So. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, to do the finger? Let me tell you about the other hold them all first. I'm sorry. Um, I, I used to have real fast reflexes. It, it came from being tuned, you know, kind of like on edge all the time. And one of the things that happened was uh, they called me over to the programmer's uh, office. And when I walked in, one guy says, catch, and he threw a brick at me. I could see the brick in midair. It had the ridges. It had a little bit of mortar left on it. Papers I'm carrying became expendable, and I went like this and I pumped it into the trash can. I remember using two hands because I knew I couldn't do it. And I got an NMI from my hands, non maskable interrupt, and that's the courtesy of Chuck Pell. They said, That didn't hurt enough. I looked down, it's foam, but they had put it right at my head. Everybody else had freaked and thrown it. I'm the one that pumped it into the trash can. I'm starting to come at the guy that threw it, right? <laughs> so, so that was kind of the, the strategy, you know. I was, they, they messed with me and I messed with them. So one of the things they went through was I'd be carrying coffee and somebody would lower his shoulder like he was going to throw a punch. And I, I just, you know, the coffee became expendable and it'd get on me. So I learned to uh, disembark the coffee in their direction. <laughs> so if somebody throw a punch, the coffee would go their way and they never did it again. <laughs> so then one time the guy just did, he just twitched. He knew, you know, because when you watch somebody, you watch your shoulders and their diaphragm and stuff. And he made me flinch, and it pissed me off a little bit. So I counted the steps. I heard him get one and a half, two and a half. I knew he was between steps. I turned, I grabbed him, and I just shoved him into the wall. Right, I, right I mean, right off his feet, because I caught him between his steps. He went into the wall. The expression on his face is suddenly, as well, you know, you see this part of his face, and he's got this expression. When he steps out of the wall, and he's got the white shit all over him. There's the back of the urinals. I've never seen a back of the urinal. <laughs> So here's the QA guy. Well, we're working on the hole in the wall. The new, you know, he's giving reports on the new hole in the wall. So that one was a semi-malicious hole in the wall. So years later, you know, people would talk about me there. They didn't say he was a good troubleshooter because yeah, I could troubleshoot anything. They, they, they said, yeah, he did this hole in the walls. You know, so my legacy got kind of stained by that. But but he he didn't he stopped doing that too. So you know, it was good negative reinforcement. My finger, I just did this three years ago. Um, and somebody asked uh, yesterday, you, you, had, you had asked, um, and Jimmy Fallon just did, actually. Uh, I'm a safety freak. We're trauma. I've seen every part of the body. I've seen motorcycle accidents, so just anything you can imagine, children. And so I was just, I was working around the house, and I had just taken off my, my gloves. I just lifted my safety goggles. I stepped this high off a ladder, and you know how you kind of just slip off your heels on, onto the ground? It didn't matter. I'm only going to slide that far. Put my hand up in my wedding ring, caught a nail head, and stripped the finger off the, off the bone. I heard like this bang in my head. I, heard, I, I got like eight, eight, eight high-speed snapshots of the process of the finger being stretched and pulled off. So um, 
it, it was a, uh, I looked at it once, again, I've worked trauma, I'm like, oh, so that's what that feels like. You know, because I was like, what, what would feel like that? No, oh, my finger's gone off. Um, you know, I started to run, you know, no, I shouldn't say run, I went to trot, it was a hot day. I went to trot to the house and I stopped myself and walked because I did not want to fall out. I did not want to go down and because, you know, your hand knows where to do pressure, by the way, so no bleeding at this point. But I knew if I went unconscious, I'd bleed. And so I walked up, and I'm trying to open the, you know, open the door, with my, yelling at my kids. Well, you know, kids don't hear stuff when they don't want to hear. So I'm trying to say, you know, let your dad in. He's missing a finger, doesn't want to let go of his hand so you can open the door for him. So I ended up waiting uh, 30 minutes for at the ambulance. I used to run an ambulance squad. That's, that's not that poor performance. I had to call a second time going, did tell you it's an amputation, right? Meanwhile, I've set myself on the floor. Ice bagged it, got it in the air, and I'm not going to move till, till the ambulance gets there. So I'm trying to run my own call. You know, I'm like, put the dogs away. Uh, you go see if the ambulance doesn't drive by. You know, I'm trying to do that while still trying to keep my own calm head and stuff. Well, the kids that showed up on the ambulance were what we would have called probies in the old days. None have been in for more than a year. Um, they all came in to see the amputation when one should have been out back, out with the ambulance trying to figure out how to turn it around. So I had to offer, you know, I'll turn it around for you, dude. you just hold my hand, you know. So uh, it, it was an eventful day because once something happens, what, what you learn in working with in emergency medicine is there are so many, how many families would turn back the clock a quarter second if they could, you know, so the kid steps in front of a car or something. So I, it's not like I regretted it, I just, it already happened and I just had that mindset. So the cool part was when I got to the ER, uh, the doc walks in, and I'm, I'm wearing an old faded uh, Star of Life shirt that I wear, you know, wearing around the house. He says, well, we got, I said, well, I have a complete avulsion from the intermediate uh, 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 flange down to the, he says, all right, who are you? And, I, you know, I gave him my credentials. I used to fly at the 103rd Medical Battalion, you know, I used to work at Cooper Trauma. And what was cool then is, as, as they bring in, like, a specialist or somebody goes, eh, hey, this is Bill, he used to fly with the 103rd Medical Battalion, he'll tell you what's wrong. So I got to be, you know, do the bullet myself. And then they let me be my own tech. So I'm sitting there, uh, you know, helping them trying to, as we're trying to disentangle the ring. And the tech that's now has nothing to do is watching, he goes, he's doing some kind of ninja mind trick for pain. And I just look at it because I'm doing like Zen breathing, you know, and, and doing. And, and so uh, it, it, it was an interesting day. I, I could tell you the stories all the way to the hospital, but I ended up uh, by midnight, I was in an OR. Um, meanwhile, when I'd gone to leave the house, um, my son, right as we're, he had never been left alone. And my wife's at a quilting club. First time she's left the house in, in years. Um, so I said, well, you're going to be alone tonight for the first time. I'm going to go with these nice men in the ambulance. And as we're getting to the door, my son comes running up. Dad, Dad, what's the code to the Xbox? So I knew he was going to be OK, right? He wants to play Xbox all night long now that Dad's gone. So here I am about to go in, and so everywhere I go is, are you married? Yeah, I haven't told my wife yet. She'll, she'll get home tomorrow, I'll just be missing a finger. Um, it, we were at 11 o'clock at, at the hospital in Philly, because they kept transferring me closer to a hand specialist. And I got, they, they came to me, and of course I'm cracking jokes all the time. They're like, well, you're right-handed? Well, now I am. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get to when you're doing the right. Or try and sign with a hand just to screw them up. They said, there's somebody claiming to be your wife here. Well, my wife had followed the trail from deep in Jersey and found me, you know, finally found me up in the thing. And, and so my son had texted her and stuff. So that's the short version of, of how I tore my finger off. So it was just another day in the life of being Bill Hurd, you know. So moral of don't wear rings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And you can't reattach it. If you cut it off, you could because there'd be arteries and nerves and stuff. But picture like you have a chicken bone and you pull the chicken meat off. This. You can't put the bone of meat back on. So. All right. Thank you, everybody. Oh, no, Bill. I, think they, I think this is your question. Your question for that guy. Eh, I think I answered it. Thanks, oh. thanks for finding it. Um, well, do you want to read it? And I'll, I'll try and answer it quick. I don't want to prolong things here. What is this? That's he invented a chip here that we should have used. It's imaginary. Imaginary? So. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill.